So my name is Tish Lewis. I am the University Art Gallery Coordinator. Um, I am the one responsible for maintaining the current exhibition, which is for our current artist, Tatsuki Hakoyama. Uh, his exhibition is Searching for the Middle Path, in which now he'll be presenting a lecture based off the artwork in that exhibition. Uh, he deals with trying to find the middle path between Western or Eastern and Western cultures. And he has lived, or he's from Japan, lived in Samoa, and now he's been in the States for about 16 years. Uh, but with this lecture, he will go over a little bit of his background and he'll give more insight as to the work that he's presenting. Um, I do want to thank you all for coming out and he'll go ahead and start the lecture. Here's Tatsuki Hakoyama. All right, so thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here. Um, before I start talking about my work, um, I'll just talk a little bit about myself besides, you know, the personal cultural background because that comes in a little bit later, uh, just so you get a sense of who I am. Um, so just starting with the like, educational background, um, I went to Central Michigan University uh, for my bachelor's degree um, in art and Following that, I attended Kendall College of Art and Design, um, which is technically part of Ferry State University, but it's located in Grand Rapids. Uh, after I received my Master of Fine Arts, I've been teaching as an adjunct faculty there, uh, teaching college classes as well as various youth and adult classes. And I also coordinate a youth community initiative called Site Studio. Um, and you know, in addition to that, I also exhibit my work throughout Michigan and a couple other places. Um, so exhibitions in like Mount Pleasant, um, Lansing, Grand Rapids, and now here, um, as well as a variety of jury exhibitions in places like Kalamazoo, Muskegon, Birmingham, Lansing, Ann Arbor, places like that. Um, and although a lot of the, uh, mo all the work that's in this exhibition is oil paintings, I do like to work with things like charcoal, uh, also, as well as like relief printmaking, uh, I feel like, you know, it's just fun to work with different stuff, right? I'm trying to get into photography as well, but it's, uh, I'm still working on that one. Um, so, let's see. If, I, if you can raise your hand, how many of you actually like public speaking? <laughs> we have one person, all right, two. How many of you dislike or are indifferent about public speaking? All right, see, like most of you, I actually despise public speaking as well. But now that I'm you know, teaching and when you're active as an artist, you have to do that. Um, so at any point, if you feel like I'm talking too fast, just raise your hand, just tell me to breathe and slow down. But besides that, it will be great if you can hold off on your questions until the end so that I can maintain you know, some kind of flow to the, the presentation. Um, so I'll start talking about my uh, background. So I was born and raised in Japan. Uh, and I feel like when people hear like Japan, we have this idea of like, you know, the urban cities and like, you know, the advanced technology, that kind of things, uh, which is true in a lot of the urban areas. This is a photo of a city called Nagoya, which was the closest city uh, from where I grew up. Uh, this is where my parents are from. And um, it's actually one of the larger cities in Japan, probably about fourth or fifth largest. It's just not as well known because it's a little more uh, industrial and residential than some of the bigger names that you've probably heard of. Um, so in, by, in contrast to that, the place I grew up is this. So this is about 40 minutes to an hour outside of Nagoya, called, a small village called Obara. Um, I was born and raised there primarily, and you can tell those are rice fields and mostly just a bunch of trees around us. Um, so although I was born in Japan and raised in Japan and I visited the cities, um, I actually grew up in this small village of about 3,000 people. Uh, I walked about an hour to school up a mountain one way to get there uh, every day when I was going to school there. So when I was there, you know, I got to kind of experience both that, you know, city environment as well as the very, very traditional countryside that you would, uh, that you could probably try to imagine a little bit in Japan. And then when I was eight, my family moved to a country called Samoa. Uh, for those of you who are not so great with geography, I have a map for you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so Samoa is right here um, with the arrow there. Now you should be able to see 
if you know where Hawaii is, that's you know a couple thousand miles north of where Samoa is. Uh, you may have heard of American Samoa, which is technically a U.S. territory, but the place we, my family moved to is actually an independent country. Um, how many of you have seen Moana, the movie? Some of you? So that's a very similar, uh, Moana was based off a of, uh, Polynesian culture, which Samoa is a part of. So, you know, it's a very similar traditional culture that, you know, is portrayed in Moana. That's the same um, um, kind of similar lifestyle and environment that Samoa is based on, you know. So you can see uh, it's a tropical island country. Um, so I spent my, let's see, from the age of 8 until 12 there. Um, I did not speak any English there yet, so basically we, mo we moved there and my parents said, you're going to school here. So I learned my English there initially. Uh, they speak Samoan and English, uh, so some of them will speak only Samoan, some of them speak both English and Samoan. Um, so these photos are actually taken from this past summer because I was able to go back this summer to see how much has changed uh, since 16 years ago when I lived there. Uh, so these are from this summer, but you can tell those are just free roaming pigs. Uh, that was right outside the place I was staying at. And that is about two minutes outside from the center of the capital city. So you can see, you know, even though things have changed, it's a very different standard that you would have in a country like this. Um, the bottom uh, left shows a uh, very traditional cooking style, like stone oven cooking, called umu. Um, I'm sure you, if you've seen Moana, you've probably seen a little bit of that as well. So they basically heat up these rocks to a point that it's really hot, and then you steam it by covering with a bunch of other rocks and, you know, leaves and things like that. Um, so going back after 16 years, there were a lot of things that changed, but there were also some things that didn't change. Um, for one, the school uniform from the, the school I attended is still the same. I'm not too happy about the color choices of their uniform, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's still the same. Um, the main difference is, though, is that when I was there, um, they still allowed corporal punishment, and that's, you know, in the 1997, 98, those. Um, in fairly recent years, I think in the past couple, you know, past few years, they abolished corporal punishment. Um, so that has changed, but there are some things where, you know, it's not as common for someone's children to get glasses and things like that. If they can't see from the back of the room, they'll just walk up, sit on the floor, and learn from the floor. So you can see that there's a very different, like, set of standard and norm when you start to, like, experience different cultures. So just a couple more photos. So, I mean, again, a lot has changed when, like, I was there initially, Maybe one out of like 10 families had like, you know, old school like TVs with, you know, one channel for the whole country. Um, now they actually have two like smartphone, like internet service providers, which is a big thing. They have two. Yeah. Um, but even with the, you know, technology being imported, there are certain some things that just doesn't change, like people riding on the back of the truck without any. I think those are like curvy roads across the mountain and stuff. Like they won't care. They will just, they'll just do it. Again, those are just some of the things where like you don't really think about until you see it and realize like okay, they're just different sets of standards that you have to acknowledge. And then um, when I was 12, my family moved to the U.S., uh, specifically Mount Pleasant, Michigan. So there, I attended Mount Pleasant High School, and then you know went to Central Michigan University, Kendall, and now that's basically my life story there. Uh, so. When I first moved to Samoa, you start to realize, like, even though I experienced some of the country lifestyle, like, I still had no problem accessing electricity, hot water, you know, actually having walls. Um, traditional Samoan houses are essentially just roofs held up by pillars. There's no walls, like, there will be cockroaches flying around at night. Um, hot water was, you know, if, that was only if you're lucky, you know. So again, like, all these things that you, you don't even question until you start to not have it. Like, you start to realize everything is just a subjective idea of what a norm is based off our, like, you know, environment that we're used to. So, like, based on that idea, like, this series kind of came to be. So, like, the Searching for the Middle Path series is kind of my own way of, like, trying to analyze and understand the values and, like, the uh, positive and negative influences of different uh, cultural norms, values, and traditions. Because we all know, like these things, you know, influence those things in both positive and negative way. We can't just, you know, talk in absolutes. It just doesn't work that way. Like it's so easy to say, well, the like the old ways were better, but at the same time, you know, 
I can see that there are values to the old ways, but I like my smartphone. So like, so you know, there are certain things like, of course, like technology is good. But then again, when you start to say, well, technology is always better, you start to realize, well, what about all these other issues from pollution, things like that, that's causing issues. So, you know, this whole series is based off my like experience like in Samoa, which was very traditional in the lifestyle that they had. And contrasting that with Japan, which has you know thousands of years of history and culture that um, and then, you know, in recent years, you know, and when I say recent, we're talking like the past, you know, 100 years, post-World War II, we just started to develop and became one of the more, you know, world, you know, recognized in the world for its technological advancements. And then we also have countries like the U.S., which is very young and, you know, arose out of this melting pot idea. So, like, there's a very distinct, you know, like, um, qualities in each of these cultures that I experienced. And I can see, like, the positive and negative in all of these when I contact cultures. So like my goal here is to try to find out exactly like what are the positive qualities in each of these cultures and try to blend that into my own like personal identity. So I'm trying to like, you know, criticize and analyze these different things through different, you know, views and then hopefully in the end find this what, you know, I'm referring to as the middle path which is the, you know, harmonious blend of all these different uh, good qualities that we can have. And again, I feel like to be able to find a good balance, you just need to realize and try to continue to expand the different boundaries that we set among you know, ourselves. When you're an artist, you always reference different you know, um, philosophers and such because you need to figure out what you resonate with and what, you know, what your work is based on. Um, luckily, there are a lot of philosophers that would, uh, you know, already have written a lot of things already so that you don't have to write it yourself. Uh, so a lot, one of the uh, persons that I look, you know, look at is Homi Bhabha, and he's more known for his post-colonial theory. And usually, you know, you don't really think of Japan, like someone like Japanese person like me, to be as, you know, influenced by post-colonial theory because you don't have the idea of, you know, Japan being colonized as much. But his idea of hybridity and third space actually, you know, resonate with me very much. So like, yeah. So the idea of hybridity comes from the fact that, you know, um, histories and culture like always intrude into the present in how we understand and like how we have to keep transforming our understanding of the, you know, environment. And from that hybridity idea came the third space theory. And that's where like, um, we try to draw on different, you know, and like what's surrounding us to make sense of what we see and what, you know, what's around us. So with this third space theory, when you have two different groups in the same community, we don't really have as much of a diversity, but it's more so hybridity because we still are exposed to and we start to make sense based off what's surrounding us. You can't completely separate everything all the time. So like that's where that third space theory comes to you know comes into effect. Um, so even though like again, Japan's usually not one of the countries you think of in terms of post-colonial theory, but for me I think it's a very valid thing and it applies to a lot of different things. So the whole idea with this is that you know I've experienced the you know lifestyle in Japan. I still go back periodically. Uh, lifestyle in Samoa, same thing in the United States. And my goal is to find that middle section there and fill that up with the, what I value to be the positive aspect of all of these different things so that that becomes my own hybrid identity. And even though I may not feel like I fully belong when I go to Japan, I still fully don't belong when I'm in the US. And when I go to Samoa as well, I don't fully belong, but at the same time, all of those still you know, are part of what, how I understand that, you know, my own world. And then I do also have, you know, artistic and aesthetic influences. Um, if you haven't noticed my tie, it is a painting by Dali. Uh, so I thought today was the best day to wear this that I wore today. Uh, so surrealism it has always been interesting to me. Um, how many of you are familiar with surrealism? At least about half of you. That's um, so I chose Dali here because I think he's the most iconic of the surrealists. Um, 
so for those who are unfamiliar with the surrealist you know movement uh, their work a lot of times dealt with the exploration of like the subconscious and unconscious mind uh, so they kind of went back to the Freudian ideas, exploration of the dreams, dreamlike state, things like that in their work. And oftentimes they would uh, juxtapose different symbols that you know are in the pieces. And although my work itself doesn't really reflect on subconscious or anything, uh, because I have logical reasons for why I make my work, you know, I have it's a you know more analytical process. Uh, but this juxtaposition of symbols allow me to bring in different elements from the cultures that I experienced into that same composition. And among the surrealists, um, the most influential one, probably, for me, is René Magritte. Um, he's not as popular as Dali, but he's pretty famous still. Uh, and one of the reasons why I find his work to be a lot more interesting is that he does go through, like, back and forth between surrealism -like style as well as the magic realist style. And I said magic realism a couple of times. I'll talk about that in a you know, short while. But the difference is that although Magritte was oftentimes considered a surrealist, his work, like his desire, wasn't really to paint things that he couldn't you know, comprehend. Like a lot of times if you ask a surrealist what their work is about, they will give you a bunch of gibberish because they can't really you know, grasp what those are. That's the whole idea of the movement is to explore something that's in the unconscious mind. And if you can explain it, that's not really unconscious. So, um, that's the main difference between some of the Magritte's like, attitude towards making work is that even though the style was in similar to the Surrealist, like, he had a very strong desire to paint what reflected the real world. Um, so again, even though like, some of his stuff is usually considered Surrealistic work, um, it's very different and just the conceptual foundation is very different that he really wanted to like, depict the condition of the human mind through like you know slightly weird uh, images like the one on the left you know you know that would, that would never happen in real world but the, then again it's not like some of the other surrealists who would just morph and you know um, you know defy gravity and just start doing all these what we usually consider to be weird uh, stuff so just you know for those who are unfamiliar with you know the different styles and movements uh, I just made a very quick chart. So magic realism is different from surrealism in a way that it's more of an artistic style because surrealism traditionally was a actual movement. Um, although in recent years, I feel like it's being used for anything that you know, has that dreamlike quality, like fantasy-like aspect of it. But traditionally, surrealism was a movement where it was founded by Andrew Breton and he had a manifesto actually saying what it was about. So if you didn't fit in that technically, even if you made similar work, you weren't really a surrealist. But again, nowadays it's starting to change a little bit. But the main difference here is that like with surrealism, you're trying to do something that is like impossible and it's imaginary. But a lot of the magic realists would try to create something that's imaginative and implausible, but maybe not impossible. So like when you have like surrealistic work and you start to take away like um, the sense of like you know defining of like gravity as well as that uh, exaggerated morphing of the space you start to create the similar style of that magic realism so a lot of the magic realists um, try to create like sense of like mystery in a lot of like mon like mundane situations again there is a range of like styles like an artist associated with magic realism but overall a lot of them still try to like maintain it to the similar like sense of space in the world that we exist. Among the you know more famous of the magic realists is George Tucker. Um, I believe this one for like a second was referencing The Simpsons, so it's at least something, right? Even if you've never seen that. Um, and magic realist, um, and in this case, I'm talking more so the artistic movement because it was also a literary movement with a lot of authors uh, working the magic realist style. Uh, the foundation is very similar, but just you know, with the different media comes, you know, different uh, images. So oftentimes, like magic realists, uh, historically speaking, have dealt with social issues. So even George Tucker, uh, artists like Peter Bloom, they work with, you know, some of the issues, social issues that were going on in, at their time. And that was possible because they reflected more so on that real, you know, real world aspect of space and uh, environment. 
because again, if you just were working completely in surrealistic style, basically you disregard that sense of the real world and you can't really, um, you know, push that sense of like questioning what's going on in the, the you know, the physical world we exist. Um, I also have a favorite Jap Japanese artist. Again, although he kind of goes back and forth between surrealism and magic realism style, in my opinion, um, you know, it's you can start to see how his juxtaposition and like kind of overlapping of some of the images create a unique narrative almost. Um, some of them seem a little depressing, but again, I do find his work to be very um, intriguing in a way that it comments on the, the environment where he was actually, you know, uh, in. So at this point, I think I'm going to like start to like uh, introduce some of the cultural symbols and like kind of deconstruct a couple of my pieces so you can understand how my mind works. Um, well, I'll try my best because I don't fully understand how my mind works, but I'll try my best. Maybe I should have, you know, gone into more surrealist style than I would know how my subconscious works, but sadly I didn't go that route. Um, so each of the work that I have in this exhibition is a little bit like dealing with the different ideas. So even though the underlying premise is that I'm trying to find balance in things that seem to oppose each other, uh, a lot of them dealing with the traditional and contemporary lifestyle. Uh, some of them work with more of like environmental issues that you know is caused as an outcome of that shift from the more contemporary lifestyle to the traditional lifestyle. Um, things like cultural values and identities that shift through like you know globalization, things like that, that all influences how we view the world. Uh, so each of the things are different. So when you go into the gallery at any point, you can try to figure out, maybe, you know, start to like break down and just ask yourself what it might mean. So the first symbol that I'll you know, talk about is the koi nobori, which is a uh, windsock shaped like a koi fish that is usually flown, uh, flown during Children's Day, which is May 5th in Japan. Um, and it symbolizes like hope of like good, you know, strength and like, you know, health, good health for the kids. And it references the originally Chinese mythology that when a koi fish swims upstream the Yellow River and, you know, reaches this dragon gate, it starts to, you know, it turns into a dragon. So that, you know, mythology trend, uh, kind of got into Japan and then it became this, you know, tradition of the koi nobori. So using that here, I'm like taking that idea and trying to see what I can discuss about um, the idea of like disasters. Because uh, you know, when you look in the traditional sense, when you talk, you know, disasters were mostly natural. Things like, you know, hurricanes, cyclones, earthquakes, volcanoes. And then when you start to get into more contemporary like environment, disasters can be very different. You can have, you know, car accidents, you know, um, or even nuclear disasters, which is, you know, why this piece is here. So with this one, I decided to juxtapose that nuclear power plant with the very iconic volcano of Japan, the Mount Fuji. Um, along with that, you know, using the koi no boi, the, the reference of the koi fish and the dragon, I'm trying to like figure out what the values are that's in the contemporary environment. Um, I'm sure you're probably at least heard of the, you know, the March 11th. Uh, 2011, the, the Fukushima disaster. Um, so that is still, that's still there. There's still a lot of radiation that just doesn't go away, like you know, right away. Um, and although the government is still in that phase, we have this tradition that, and you know, and the symbols that represent the good health for children. So I always wonder at what point do these symbols and cultural icons become superficial things, where if the, a lot of the countries, you know, ideas contradict that, is it really becoming a cultural symbol still, or is it no longer um, something, anything of value? So like, I'm always questioning some of these things where like, we go through these motions, but does it still really have value as a culture? Um, again, these things are not something that has like a right or wrong answer, sadly. Uh, I wish it was that simple, but if that was simple, I wouldn't be here. So. Um, <laughs> And then I'll move on to the next piece here. Um, so I do use origami a lot in my work. And one of the reasons is because I can make a lot of different things using origami. 
but whatever I make would always have the undertone of the, my Japanese background. So it allows me to make something and you know, use it within my composition uh, instead of relying on just one object. And even then, with that, I do use the orizuru ara, uh, which is the paper cranes. Uh, cranes in general have always been a symbol for like longevity in Japan. And from that idea kind of you know, came this uh, legend that if you fold a thousand paper cranes, um, like your wish would be you know, granted. And it was popularized after you know, the World War II with Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. So it, you know, in the recent years, since then, like, it's become like, a symbol of peace and like, uh, healing, process of healing. So like, again, like, some of these symbols are just, although when you look at individual things, it's you know, easy to kind of comprehend. But I always try to see it in like, the context in which it, you know, the, the culture and the environment is, because um, last year in the summertime, I visited Japan, and I did stop by the Hiroshima Memorial there, uh, where the, the nuclear bomb was dropped. And they do have a lot of these orizuru there to symbolize the process of health and healing. Yet the current, uh, you know, political climate in Japan is more about you know uh, militarization, uh, ready for getting into war. So when although you have these symbols of peace and healing, at the same time the country as a whole is starting to shift to a different way. Again, there are always oppositions against those things, but at the same time, like we start to like, you know, I start to question at what point do these cultural symbols and values start to become, you know, literally like paper thin, you know, just where there's no value whatsoever. Um, another symbol that I do use a couple of times in my series here is a tori, which is a gate often um, seen around or by uh, Shinto shrines and it symbolically separates the pure from the impure world. So usually you have to like kind of cross into the pure world to get to these shrines. And although image-wise they're very nice, but at the same time the, the, the reality of some of these things are always a little bit different because um, you can go to a very famous shrine in Japan called Fushimi Inari, where you might have seen images where the, like, they have thousands, like, hundreds of these gates, just one after another. And I did climb up to the top, like last time I was, I was in Japan. But the sad thing is that when you look at the back of these gates are the names of you know, sponsors that funded those gates. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it like starts to question, like we have these symbols that are supposed to have value, yet as the culture shift in, you know, with time, some of these value also starts to shift. And I'm always like, curious to know at what point are these the new ways of approaching things starting to uh, jeopardize some of the values that should be still preserved. Again, I'm not saying that everything needs to be preserved, but I just feel like we should be able to find some kind of balance where you know, we don't just go crazy with everything else. And another symbol um, that I used in my central piece here um, is the statue of Ninomiya Kinjiro. This is also an interesting one for me because, um, so he was a philosopher, economist, um, agricultural leader, and he uh, did a lot during his time in the later years of Edo period. Edo period is from like the 1600s till the late, like the late 1800s. Um, and he said to like, he studies all the time and like the statues like shows him working and walking and studying all at the same time. And his statue is usually seen in, you know, right by the gates of like elementary schools. Um, there was actually one right by the entrance of the school that I attended when I was still in Japan. But at the same time, in current, like recent years, this is becoming an issue because some people are complaining that it's promoting walking while on smartphones. <laughs> Again, there have been cases of these uh, statues being taken away from school because of that issue. Again, you start to realize how these values shift when we start to introduce new environment, new technology. And again, it's only when you start to like push it too far instead of you know, meeting halfway, it starts to lose the sense of value, I feel like. So with that, you know, this is the central piece to my you know, exhibition. So you can see um, the statue there, as well as um, a person, although it's me, it's a person. I'm just going to go with that. Um, and I have a phone and a disposable you know, cup like you would get from any fast food places. Um, again. I use, you know, smartphones. I still use electricity. I still go to fast food sometimes. It's really just about finding a good balance. So 
I'm trying to, with this piece, like ju juxtapose the almost the, you know, opposing qualities of traditional and contemporary like lifestyle as well as values, and trying to find that like overlapping place where I can still maintain some of the things that I find to be valuable from traditional lifestyles, which you know I've experienced some of that while I was in the countryside in Japan, as well as you know lifestyle in Samoa, and trying to figure out how can we maintain some of that when we are. You know, moving through in this more technological age. Now, when I work with you know a lot of these cultural symbols, I do get comments sometimes about um, that people don't see as many Western influences of symbols in my work. Although, if you walk around the uh, the gallery, you would see like I'm using like traffic lights that are obviously more Western, uh, primarily U.S. Um, as well as you know excavators, things like that are you know for the most part you can kind of categorize it as a Western symbol. And for me though, like even some of these basic things like the buildings that you can see at the bottom, to me is a very Western thing. Because when you go to a country like Samoa where the traditional houses are just roofs and pillars, this is a very Western, even though it's simplified and abstracted, this is a very Western approach to buildings. Um, and when I went back this summer, I could actually see the difference in the number of Western houses in Samoa versus you know, 16 years ago. And uh, I was talking to some of the family and friends that were there, and we actually, uh, they actually told me about some of the class differences that are more apparent because of the, you know, the, the increase in this Western-style housing. And the Samoan traditional cu uh, culture like, always promotes this the idea of sharing and having a good, close sense of community. Uh, they would share anything that they were able to. Uh, if they, if some, one person had a TV and there was a, you know, boxing match they wanted to watch. Anybody who were around could just go in and watch. That was the culture that they had. But now, once we start to introduce more of this Western house style, they start to have more fenced-in, you know, plot. Though some of those start, you know, cultural values start to kind of disappear. Um, again, sadly, there isn't like at what point that becomes, you know, beneficial and stuff. It's just there's just too many things to consider. But I think it's important to just start thinking about some of these and. I do feel like it's very important to just, for me, you know, to try, always try to keep in mind some of the, the almost the opposing qualities that I experienced in Samoa. Because now that I've been in the U.S. for a very long time, I can tell a lot of my values and you know, my perception is starting to be morphed into what I experienced here. But I do feel like when you start to realize, like, well, you know, even just having hot water for shower is a very you know, uh, valuable thing when you have to shower in cold water you know, every single day. So I think it's very important just to have that sense of like, you know, like the desire to understand what might be the con like the contradicting things to what the things that we have. And another thing that I do is this like cutout panels that gives a sense of perspective a little bit more. Um, and you probably wouldn't know unless you've taken art history classes, but even this sense of perspective is actually a very Western influence in my work. Traditionally, Oriental artworks would have parallel lines that goes back and you know goes up and down, and anything that's on the lower side of the composition meant that it was visually closer to us. Things that were further back were visually further away. Um, it was more so after Japan opened up its doors in the late 1800s that you know a lot more perspective-based artwork and stuff came into the country, um, and. For me, like even that use of perspective is actually a lot of Western influence in my work. But for me, that's a very important thing because I always want my work to have some kind of you know reference to the real world that we exist. Because I feel like it's very easy when you look at artwork to be like, well, that's an artwork, that's a painting. It's not part of the real you know reflection of the real world. Sometimes it's the you know almost a metaphysical space that exists beyond that surface. But because when you form one, I'm influenced by magical realists, and I really want this sense of like connection to the physical space, I decided to kind of exaggerate the sense of overlap and the perspective so that visually, even though they are uh, primarily you know, two-dimensional, I want my work to have that sense of three-dimensional quality so that um, the painting kind of breaks into a real world where we have to start to acknowledge that it's an extension, it's reflecting, but it's an extension of the physical world that we exist. And in addition to that, like what this perspective does for me is to give the sense of like oppositions in different ways. 
So what I'm creating a space inside as you know there, and we are here. And by breaking that like um, the wall between the painting and the world, I'm trying to like kind of create that like division, like tear down that division of that you know metaphysical and the physical space. I'm hoping like you can start to like reflect in that idea of that third space where things can overlap. We can have these imaginative, imaginative environments and the physical environment that is you know guided in logic and you know science and physics, and try to blend them in into the, this you know a little more uh, slightly more fan, like fantasy like space. And in addition to like having this sense of perspective, a lot of my works are all uh, also created in pairs, and that's kind of the similar idea where I want to like really emphasize the idea of balance and. Um, the easiest way for us to acknowledge balance is to have a very symmetrical, like you know, uh, layout. So I try to create these in pairs, and depending on the gallery space, I'll try to like work with what I can do to keep that sense of um, balance. Because anytime you have image like this, we we should, I'm hoping, that you s at least like acknowledge that there are two different ends, right? So like there are two different ends that lead you towards the center. So like I'm trying to like almost control what the viewer would see and like get drawn. Like when you stand in front of a wall like this, I'm hoping that you get start to get drawn into the center part. And again, that's because my goal here is to really find that central balance point for everything in life that seems to be opposing each other. So with this work, a lot of it really is just about like finding, like acknowledging that there are different oppositions in life, whatever that may be. Again, that could be something that is based off cultural things like me, where you know I experienced a very traditional lifestyle in Samoa, and going into more you know developed country. Um, it could be really just even simple things like joy and anger. It could be any of these things. And what's important is that we can't just ignore one thing. We can't just you know indulge in one thing. We always have to be you know conscious of what's opposing. And then at that point, try to be able to find that balance so that we always know what's on the other side. Because as soon as we start to live in a country where we can always have hot water, it's hard to appreciate the hot water, right? It's only when you start to have to shower in the cold water for days that you're like, okay, hot water just sounds so good right now, right? Um, so again, like I feel like it's very important to acknowledge that these oppositions just to be able to appreciate and understand this, you know, different views. And again. Some of my work will deal with the environmental things, and that's because like Samoa is very used to be very traditional, where like they would use every single part of a coconut. So they would you know use coconut part to milk you know make coconut milk. The part that gets squeezed out, they would feed it to the chickens. The shells become charcoal, uh, and bowls as well. The tree trunks would be used for pillars for you know traditional housing. Leaves would be used for you know making baskets. So like they really used every single part of that, and you know that was a lot more apparent. Um, now, again, when the times change, a lot of those things will start to change because there are going to be a lot more, you know, plastic, metal things like that that would influence some of the environment that exists. Um, so again, I feel like you know when I talk about the environmental issues, some of them are very closely related to this, you know, mindset of like more contemporary lifestyle as well as the traditional lifestyle. Again. There are, you know, we have things that we try to recycle more. Those things are always there. And for me, it's always really just about finding that right balance so that we always don't, you know, think of it as it's always going to be there. It's always going, you know, that to me, that's the idea of like indulgence where we can't, you know, fully understand the opposing end. And most of these work for me is really just, it's a way for me to like analyze my own thoughts. So these are like visual representation of like some of these thought process that I have, and I'm just using cultural symbols to help me figure out exactly what's going on in my mind. And I'm hoping that, you know, I can always maintain some of the values that I have from my cultural you know, experience so that when I, ha when, I don't f when I feel like I don't fit in anywhere, I still know who my hybrid identity is, you know, who I am that way. And lastly, I just want to talk briefly about my new body of work. Um, so this is what I've been working on recently, uh, which is called the Darkness and Light series. I'm still working on it. I only have about eight or nine paintings so far. Um, it's very similar in terms of like the content and concept in a way that I want people to acknowledge the, the dualities of things. 
So like, you know, light in the dark is an obvious, you know, opposition of things. But the way we view the darkness and light has shifted, I feel like at least. So like with these work, I'm trying to create some kind of narrative so that we start to like wonder how we view darkness, how we view light. You know, we've always had this issue, you know, traditionally when we do before electricity, we've always been afraid of the dark. Do we really have that sense though, or do we still not like worry about it because we always have so much access to electricity? Like those kind of things where, you know, it's always necessary for us to keep in mind that there's always opposition because as soon as you start to take that away, our values will basically, you know, shift. And at that point, there is nothing to, con when you have nothing else to contrast, there might be something that, you know, some of the values that are completely lost. So those are some of the things that, you know, goes into my work in, ter um, in terms of like con conceptual things and um, images. I think that's all I have. And at this point, I'd be, you know, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have about my work. So that means either I did a really nice job where I answered all your questions, or you really, I was just rambling and you don't understand any of it. So. Or they may be saving it for the reception. That's true too. You know. <laughs> all right, well, if there's no questions, okay. Is everyone well, just shy? <laughs> it's okay. All right. Well, one thing that I did not mention during the introduction is that this lecture was funded in part by a grant provided by the Michigan Humanities Council, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we definitely thank them. Uh, but because of that, I do have a very small questionnaire that I would appreciate if you took the time to fill out, even if it is the top portion. Um, and I will be passing that out in a moment. But. Everyone, let's give a round of applause for our audience.